Hey there, I'm Dr. Amy King, otherwise known as Dr. Amy, and this podcast is the most important medicine. If you're a physician or healthcare provider, this podcast is for you. This is where we learn about trauma-informed medicine and ways to build resilience in healthcare organizations. We do this through your stories and stories of other professionals and of patients. And we listen to each other to transform medicine with compassion and curiosity about what it means to be a trauma-informed provider. Every time you join me, I want you to hear practical information and lead with tangible tools that you can use with your patients right away. Today, I am joined by Dr. Gretchen Pianca. She is a board certified pediatrician and a friend of mine who I am excited to have here. Uh, Dr. Pianca practices in Lewiston, Maine, and she is the founder of Resilience University, which is a way to support positive experiences and mitigate trauma for children and families in primary care. Hi, Gretchen. Hi, Amy. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for having me. Um, I was, uh, for people that are watching on YouTube versus listening, I was um, sharing with Gretchen that I'm wearing a cowboy um, shirt in honor of Gretchen and her Texas roots. So I'm really thrilled that, that you can be here. Um, I gave kind of a formal introduction. How else would you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, thank you. So I'm a pediatrician in Maine, um, and I practice in Lewiston, um, and I just really enjoy working with families on um, kind of trying to problem solve those times that are that are hard, like those messy moments that sometimes we feel really yucky about later. Um, you know, that's sort of, I think, one of those things that pediatricians are really good at. You know, we're used to talking about the green poop and the um, the weird spit up and is this normal and is that rash supposed to be there and what do I do about this? So families are already used to coming to us with all these weird things and they kind of don't know if that's supposed to be normal at this stage with their kid. And so what I've been just really enjoying doing is kind of normalizing those other messy moments, you know, where Johnny starts hitting his sister and you don't really know what to do about it. Or maybe you yelled and you feel like you wish you hadn't, or maybe you're just feeling like things are not going well, you know, you're supposed to be sitting at the table as a family having dinner, but every time you do, everybody just starts yelling at each other. Or maybe, you know, you're not supposed to have your kids watching so much screen time, but it's the only thing that keeps everybody sane or stuff like that. So kind of normalizing the things that aren't going well for you as a family and kind of figuring out, well, okay, let's start talking about that. How do we talk about that? How can we use these moments to foster more resilience and promote more positive childhood experiences? And usually what I'm finding is that in most of those situations, part of what's going on is that people are have experienced some sort of trauma and are having some sort of trauma response and that whatever is happening is somehow part of what needs to heal from that trauma response. And that if we can help the families kind of call it out, identify it, work on that. Um, and then if we can do that the same way that we talk about the green poop or the weird rash or whatever, it normalizes it. And it's all, it works really fluidly in that primary care setting. So it's been a really fun part. Um, probably one of the most enjoyable parts of being a pediatrician, I would say over the couple of decades I've been doing this. So, so tell me more about how you got interested in that piece, because I, I mean, in talking to, you know, tons of medical providers, physicians, nurses, this isn't something you're taught in medical school, right? So how, how did you stumble into this work and why has it created such meaning for you? So that's a very good question. So, you know, I think you're exactly right. So this is not the kind of stuff that we learn. In fact, it's sort of the opposite of what you learn. It's the kind of thing where, um, you know, you didn't get any training in this. And yet I would find myself leaving the room with at the end of a well visit or something. And I would say, is there anything, my standard exit question, is there anything I can help you guys, anything else I can help you guys with today? Mm -hmm. As I was leaving and the families would, would say something like, well, not unless you can fix the terrible twos or not unless you can make him stop hitting his sister or, well, do you have a way to fix his selective hearing, you know, and and there was sort of a joke in it, but then also I could feel this heaviness that like that was the real thing they wanted help with today. And all I did was talk about car seats and vaccines. Oh, wow. And there was just sort of this ugh feeling. And I kind of felt like I was 
um, failing them on some level. And so I just was like, you know what? I want to have an answer to that. I want to lead with that for heaven's sakes. Like I want to go in and I want to say, what is the hardest thing you're dealing with? And let's start there. And if I have any time left over, then we'll talk about car seats. But how about I give you a brochure about car seats? You can read about that on the internet. And I want to spend this precious time that I have with you talking about that thing. That's the hardest thing where you're like, not really feeling like you have any support anywhere else. So let's start there. And then that was, um, can I, you know, can that I was like, you for one second. Yeah, go ahead. I think what you're saying is, as you know, my passion, my love, right? Like everything I want pediatricians to be doing. And you and I also both know you're saying like lead with the hard stuff. And for many physicians that feels overwhelming, scary, like, wait a second, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist. And I even hear you going so far as to say, like, the things that are on the rubric that I should be checking off from, you know, healthy families or whatnot about car seats and bike, bike helmet safety, you're saying, actually, you could probably just read a brochure on that. I want to talk about, you know, what, what we would call social determinants of health or adversity. And you're saying, let's lead with that. Can you just speak to how people who might be listening might be like, that's terrifying. <laughs> totally terrifying. Exactly. And, you know, sometimes, so, so sometimes it is kind of a little bit unsettling because we're so used to our routine. We're used to going in and starting opening up the electronic, you know, medical record and starting to click the boxes and doing the things that we're used to doing. But if you think about it, um, if we've already kind of gone over these things, and maybe we've already talked about these things before, and if you can lead with like, okay, so I have this whole thing here that I can talk about. Sometimes you can actually, there's some wonderful resources like Christina Bethel's Well Visit Planner. There's some wonderful resources that allow the family to guide. What do you want to use this visit for today? So there are some resources out there that allow, and then your um, cards for connections. There's different ways that you can kind of sculpt what you're doing in the visit and help the family to kind of focus in on what they might want to talk about. Um, we've, we've sort of always been driving it with, well, here are the things like, it's kind of like if you went to a restaurant and they said, well, here, here's what you're going to have today for lunch, you know, like it's sort of like shifting it. It's like, well, wait a second. Okay. Here are the things you can have at this visit. What's important to you? What do you want to talk about? Here are all the things. And I mean, I think as providers, we all know that there's way too much to talk about at each visit. There's just way too much. There's no um, way in God's green earth that we can actually talk about all those things. And I, I, we love, to choose. <laughs> I love this analogy of the menu, right? Like <laughs> there is no restaurant that I want to go to where they're, they're like, welcome, Amy, we're serving only the cheddar and broccoli soup today. And we hope you really like it. Like I want to be able to choose based Based on my needs, based on my comfort, based on my appetite. And that's what you're saying, right? Like if we just do kind of a one size fits all, we're missing stuff that's in the room. Right. And that they might be coming in and that day that maybe they did just get a brand new car and maybe their biggest concern is how the heck do I get this car seat in my new car? And then you can start there and you can focus on that and you can tell them where to go to make sure it fits. And that's the most important thing. But if they're coming in and they don't own a car and they just lost their house and they're feeling terrified and they don't know where lunch is coming from. And, um, you know, dad just got incarcerated and they've got all these things on their plate. You could be talking about all sorts of things and they're mind is mom's mind is somewhere else. And if you're, you're not connecting, you're not connecting. And so that's just not a useful visit. And so I think it can be terrifying to us, but at the same time, I think all of us as providers, what we really want to do is something meaningful in that visit. None of us want to be spending our day just checking boxes. And so I think we all like that, um, want to have that meaningful experience in our, in our life as providers. And I think we have less partly why we're feeling exhausted and burnt out at the end of the day. A lot of the times is because we are just kind of going through checklists and going through boxes and kind of feeling like, well, did I really do anything in that one? That, that one kind of felt empty. So right. if you can connect with the family, and I think that fear comes from the fact that we weren't trained to do this, and yet we know it's really important. So mm -hmm. I think what you and I are working on is how do we really empower pediatricians 
to do those things that we kind of just didn't know we were going to need to be trained in when we were in school and we were in training, you know, we knew we were going to know, need to know how to treat diabetes and pneumonia and all that stuff. So we got all that good stuff, but then there are these other things that we just didn't really know were as important and weren't kind of like part of the curriculum then, but now that we're out and we're doing this, and now that we're starting to understand more and more the importance of trauma-informed care and the importance of all this stuff and the way we're understanding the whole universe right now, how crucial this is to everything the crucial aces are how crucial all this stuff is and we you know like we're sometimes the only people that families have so we may be you know that well visit or that um, adhd med check or something might be that only touch point that family has they might not have a counselor in the community so if we can as pediatricians we can be the ones who give them that tiny little bit a little nugget of help you know that might really be huge Oh my gosh. Okay. So I got you off track. You were talking about <laughs> how you got into this. Yeah. Um, and so we're trying to encourage people, first of all, don't be scared. You can do this. There are, there are tools, there are ways to kind of narrow the focus. Um, but you stumbled into this because as a mom, you needed it. Will you say more about that? Yeah. So I have uh, three kids and two of my kids have had um, some difficult experiences when they were younger. And what I noticed was, you know, when they would have behavior troubles, you know, I, I went to my pediatrician and asked for help. Like, how do I discipline my kids? You know, kind of how do I handle these things? You know, as a pediatrician mom, probably a lot of people who are listening to this are pediatrician parents themselves. And it can be really hard because you kind of know the information, but then you're trying to apply it with your own kids and it'd be kind of hard. And so I was asking my pediatrician, well, what do I do about this? And what do I do about that? And she'd give me the advice and I would go home and try to do it and just notice that things weren't working. Like this advice, the advice that I was giving my patients and the advice that she was giving me it wasn't working with my family. And I was like, why isn't this working? Like, this is supposed to work. This is the advice. And this was the advice that my mentors had given me, the people I really respected. I'm like, this is good advice, but it's not working. And eventually what I realized was to use Dan Siegel's um, reference, you know, the flipping your lid reference was what was happening was we were all flipping our lid. We had all had different traumatic experiences over time and we were all flipping our lid. So we were all doing this. And before the good anticipatory guidance and the discipline strategies could work, work, we had to do this again. So we all had to do something to calm our nervous systems. And that's how I got to the resilience university approach. So I was like, we have to do something first so to soothe our nervous system and get back to baseline. Then we can do something else, but first we have to do this. So, yeah. so resilience university grew out of that. Just, well, we're going to circle back to Resilience University, but for people that are listening and might not be able to see, what Gretchen's doing is she's showing at a Dan Siegel's what's called the hand model of your brain. And basically, and, and in, I'll link up to it in the show notes um, through his website and through um, me teaching it as well. But essentially what it is, is, you know, there's so much teaching that we try to do with patients and families, but if they're not in a place to hear that, or even when we're giving wonderful guidance about how to redirect behavior at home, if they're in a space of fight or flight, or emotional dysregulation, or just emotional hypervigilance, or, you know, upsetness, they're not in a place to learn. So often the techniques that are given with good intention from physicians aren't going to work in moments of high stress, tension, and whatnot. So what Gretchen's saying is everybody has to be in a calm, regulated state in order for it to work. And so that means we have to help people learn, how do I get into a calm, regulated state so that the learning that really needs to happen and the healing that needs to take place can, can occur. So I just wanted to do a little, little shout out to Dan Siegel really quick. Um, okay, and so you said that's that's really what helped you have this momentum for creating Resilience University. Yeah. And, and the compassion for parents too, realizing as a parent, how important it is as a parent for you to be able to get into that space too, because when you're feeling frantic as a parent, like, oh my gosh, they're going to be ruined for life. If I don't get them to do X, Y, or Z, you know, then your nervous system needs some help in that moment too. So it's not just about getting the kids to do five big deep breaths or to take a moment and do something to calm themselves down, but also for the parents and having that compassion for the parents. So that they know that it's okay that it's not okay right now. That's all right. This is parenting. And sometimes parenting is hard and sometimes parenting is messy and that's okay. And that just like 
sometimes when you're a parent and your child's poop is green and you don't know what to do about it, it's also okay to bring it to your pediatrician. And we're going to yeah. be right here with you. We're going to roll up our sleeves and we've got some tools and we're going to figure this out together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love this. And and by the way, um, just a note, um, I don't know that Dr. Pianca actually wants you to bring the green poop to her, but metaphorically, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, <laughs> a mess, right? Don't be afraid to bring the mess. I mean, parents feel so isolated, right? Right, right. We- you start with leading from the hard stuff and asking parents, what do you want to talk about? And if, if they can say things like you mentioned, right? Like my kids are really struggling behaviorally, or we're fighting all the time, or I'm going through a messy divorce, or my kids are struggling at school or all the stuff that just happens in kids and families lives, then you feel like you can better help them. So tell me like, what's it like to be a parent and a kid going through resilience university? What does that mean? So what I do with Resilience University is I just usually the idea of participating in it kind of comes up naturally in one of the visits, like parents will either come to me or another provider will refer kids to me, like either they're going through a messy divorce or having some behavior problems. Right now, what we're doing a lot is when families are kind of waiting for counseling because we have these atrocious long wait lists to get in with counselors. So while you're waiting for your counselor, why don't you do Resilience University with Dr. Pianca? Um, So what they do is we'll do four sessions. Each one is a 30 minute session just with me. Um, the first session we do, um, we do, we make a glitter jar and we do breathing exercises. So I teach them basic meditation skills and emphasize with the parents, just a couple really basic things. So Uh, the power of validation. So I teach them how to validate. I think a lot of parents don't understand that it's okay to validate your child's emotion, even if you don't agree with how they're behaving. Like they've never gotten that idea. It's like, if I say your feeling is okay, then I'm saying you can get away with how you're acting. So I kind of separate those two. I say, validate, validate, validate. And I actually have a little handout that I give them that gives them the language. Because a lot of times I'm like, that's okay. You don't know how to do this. Nobody did this for you when you were struggling when you were little. So of course you don't know how to do it. Here, use this language until if feels comfortable practice with my words Mm -hmm. and then also teach them that whole idea of kind of you know, the flipping your lid and how that's going to happen throughout the day. Sometimes you're going to all of a sudden realize that your good thinking part of your brain isn't really online and that's okay. That happens. You can do five big deep breaths. You can listen to music. That's okay. It takes the time it takes when your good thinking part of your brain is back online, then you can go back to whatever you need to do, whether it's cleaning your room or finishing your math, whatever it is. And then telling the parents you're, you know, talking to Johnny when his good thinking part of his brain isn't online, isn't really going to get you anywhere. So Mm -hmm. just take a break from that. And then you go do whatever you need to do. So I give them a bunch of strategies like that. We kind of just do the information dump at the first session, give them a lot of tools, a lot of strategies, information. Then I say, I want you to go work on these things. And, um, Sometimes I'll do, I like kind of repurpose sticker charts. So I kind of give them some ideas and strategies and say, I want you to try these self-care skills or try to identify these different feelings. And then they get put a little sticker or a little check mark every time they either try the self-care skill or identify the feeling and Mm -hmm. then send them and say, now go and do your homework and I'll see you next time. And then they come back a week later. And then the next session, we do another set of self-care skills, usually at the, um, at the different sessions, I have kind of a set structure for each thing I do. Um, and it sort of depends on the kids and the families right now, how much I can get done at each session, but I also do mindfulness techniques. So I do, um, toes to nose. So I do, uh, it's basically the mindfulness based stress reduction, but I call it toes to nose, start with their toes, go up to their head, check in with your body. And I tell them that you can, when your brain is kind of when you're, when you flipped your lid and your, your good thinking part of your brain isn't working, you can use your body to tell your brain that you're safe. So when your brain is thinking you're surrounded by saber tooth tigers, you can use your body to tell your brain that actually you're not. And so I do that. And then I do the five, four, three, two, one sensory stuff too. Um, And the kids act absolutely love this stuff. And the parents too, they're like, oh, I've never thought about it that way. And I tell the parents, look, this is the same stuff you use when you're not feeling good. So when you're feeling stressed or you're feeling anxious, you can use these skills too. do Maybe, five. I mean, breaths, I really imagine, oh, sorry to interrupt you, Gretchen. I imagine there are so many parents listening to you and that for the first time they're learning that skill too. Yeah. Like so I, how many of those parents say to you, nobody ever taught me this either. 
I don't, I don't think a lot of these parents have ever learned most of these skills and we do it together. So by the end of that second session, they have learned basic meditation, mindfulness, breathing exercises, and about, you know, that kind of whole idea of emotional regulation. I also teach them about emotion coaching. Um, and so I tell the parents, look, you wouldn't expect him to just go out and be an Olympic soccer player, right? You know, this is a, this is something you're going to learn. You're going to coach him through this and you may not know how to do it yet because nobody coached you. So you guys are going to be learning this together and that's all right. And I'm here as a resource if you need anything. And so I just kind of, you know, we do that and then I, we do PDSA cycles. So I love the PDSA cycle <laughs> just because you can just keep going and going and you can do it on anything. You can try to get your husband to finally put his socks in the dirty clothes bin with a PDSA cycle. He can use it for anything, <laughs> right? So I tell families, you can use this for anything, but you can use it for working on these skills. So if it doesn't work, that's okay. Okay. That doesn't mean you give up on trying to learn how to meditate. That just means that so far, this isn't something that you have integrated into your daily routine, but that way hasn't worked yet. So then you just say, okay, well, right now, if Johnny is still hitting his brother, hmm, I wonder what could be going on. Is there anything we could do to try to maybe figure out what's triggering that situation? Let's back the bus up. What's leading to the situation? What, ha what always happens before Johnny hits his brother? What's, you know, kind of what's going on? How might Johnny be feeling? And that's one of the key things that I focus on with parents is that every big unwanted behavior comes from a big unmanageable emotion. And I try to de-emphasize the behaviors, focus on the emotions. And the parents are like, what? I don't have to focus on behaviors? I'm like, no. In fact, I often spend a lot of time telling them to just stop disciplining the behaviors. And instead yeah. I want you to validate emotions. And they're like, you mean I just have to validate emotion, not discipline behaviors? And so, yeah. So this is a game changer, right? I mean, like, yeah. you know, in my heart of hearts, this is what I love, Gretchen, yeah. right? I mean, a bit, so I just want to reiterate what you just said. Behind every big behavior is a big emotion with unmet needs. And so if we can focus on the emotion then the behavior will dissipate, right? We won't even have to, and I tell parents this over and over and over. I know you do too. And I've had experiences in working with parents for five minutes or for five months. And when, when that clicks for them, right? When they look beyond the behavior and into the emotion and, and they see this kid throwing a tantrum or, you know, the toddler who's flailing back onto the floor and they say things like, oh my gosh, you look so sad. How can I help? Now, all of a sudden they're not focused on stopping the tantrum. Mm -hmm. They're validating this feeling. It's so beautiful. Can you tell me oh a God. story of like, oh my goodness, when this worked really well for a family? So one of my favorite ones, um, was this, this little boy who had, um, gotten into the situation where he was kind of just in one of these like um, vicious cycles with his mom um, where she was yelling, he was yelling, she was yelling, he was yelling. And she had taken pretty much absolutely everything away, including Christmas. Um, so everything was gone. All the toys were gone. Um, the hope of anything at Christmas was gone. Just everything was gone. And as you know, you know, a lot of times in those situations, the behaviors just worsen because at that point, what's left to live for. So he was just behaving, misbehaving at school, misbehaving at home. Um, and everything was just deteriorating. And so she brought him in and was kind of in the mindset of, you know, will you fix him? Like, there's nothing left for me to do. And I, sat, I started, I led with the whole, well, you know, my guess is that, you know, he's probably not setting out in the morning trying to ruin the day. Oh, and she gosh. looked at me and she said, huh, you don't know my kid. Mm -hmm. I said, Hmm. So, well, let's try, let's just try, you know, let's try, let's try some things. So we did the glitter jar, we did the breathing. And, um, the next time when we came back, um, she had taken away the glitter jar because he'd been misbehaving. Um, and while we were talking about that, um, she stepped out into the hall to take a phone call. And I kind of looked at the kid and I'm like, oh gosh, you know, sorry about that glitter jar. And he was like, well, that's okay, Dr. P, don't worry. He said, I can still do my breathing even without the glitter jar. Oh. And he's like, and then when I'm doing my breathing, then I don't yell at mom. Mm -hmm. And 
over time, what happened was that when he stopped yelling at mom because he was doing his breathing, then she could see that he was actually having feelings and she had her own mental health issues. But what it did was just, he was the one who got it first. So he stopped yelling. Then she could see he was having a feeling. Then she could respond to his feeling. And then they stopped that vicious cycle. And it was like, like incredible. I mean, there were clear, clearly still issues that had to be dealt with and lots of other stuff that was going on, but it was like, that was just that opening that then allowed them to change the dynamic. And that was such a stuck dynamic. Like it had been going on and going on and going on and going on, but it was the little boy that did it. Well, and I think you and I both know, right. That there are, when we're working with kids, we're really working with family history, right? Mm-hmm. And so this mom sounds like she was really wounded potentially. And she really was taking what, you know, parenting personally. And I know you and I both work a lot on trying to help parents not take things so personally and just focus on the feeling in the room. And I love what you said, right? Kids don't just set out to ruin adults days. In fact, they're born to connect and they're, they're hardwired to be in relationship with you. So I really want adults to know that if your child or any child, if you're a teacher, if you're a physician, if you're a parent, um, and you're working with kids and they're acting out, there's something else going on. And I love that this kiddo just like had the perseverance to stick with the breathing and he actually led the way for mom. Wow. I know. Isn't it beautiful? (laughs) Yeah. And at the end, I think, and and mom could see, so she could see what was going on. And then he actually, yep. It was like, he held her hand and helped her through it. So it was just beautiful. So So if if you're, if you're a physician, you don't even have a family practitioner, um, an OBGYN, if anybody who's working in this system of stress and trauma and trying to intervene, maybe you don't have time for a half an hour right? What would you advise to another physician, like just as a small place to start? So I think um, that just doing that small, so one of the most, maybe two of the most powerful things I think are just doing that simple introduction to say um, that focus more on the emotions than on the behaviors. And then the other tool is it's okay to validate the feeling and you're not necessarily letting them get away with the behavior. So validating the feeling can sound something like, and you do, you have to help them with the words because a lot of us have never felt validated. So we don't know what that sounds like, but saying, of course you feel frustrated when Johnny took your book. Anyone would feel frustrated when somebody takes something that they're reading. It's normal to feel frustrated when you when somebody takes your things. And when you feel frustrated, it's really important to take care of yourself. You don't want to end up getting in trouble every time you feel frustrated, or you're not going to be able to keep going to English class. They're going to send you to the principal's office. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a different way of responding to that frustrated feeling. So like you can give the parent some language. So that kind of thing. So if you have like a little, like a, a, um, and you're really good at this, Amy, that like a little kind of pre-packaged sentence that you can say to families so that when you, because a lot of times as providers, we do, we have parents who come in, we have families that come in and they're frustrated about something. And then we get stuck in the weeds talking about the behavior. So if you can shift away from the behavior and have a way to either validate the feeling or focus on the feeling, but that's often why people don't want to focus on the emotion is because they don't know what to do with it. So if you give them a skill to focus on the feeling, well, why would I focus on the feeling? What am I going to do with that? Validate it. Just validate. That's all you have to do. And I know that people that are listening right now, Gretchen, like this is immensely important for kids, but this works for adults too. I mean, like imagine the last time you were an angry adult and somebody was just like, calm down, just calm (laughs) down. Instead of saying like, Hey, you know, Gretchen, you seem really upset right now. Um, what's going on? Right. I've never in the whole history of knowing people seen somebody say, just calm down or just chill out work. But if we validate the feeling, right. And we stay curious about it. Now we've shifted the dynamic. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you, I, I think you've said this, but I want to give you an opportunity to, to um, really nail it down for, for folks. Why is this important? So 
when you're able to do these things, what I see is that then you are able to maintain that safe, stable, nurturing connection that is so crucial and so protective. And if you can't do that, you don't have that. These, this ability to talk about feelings is one of those seven protective childhood um, experiences, positive childhood experiences that is so protective. It actually is I think it it gives you at least two of the positive childhood experiences because you're able to both talk about your feelings with your family and feel supported by your family when you're going through hard times. So it it facilitates two of the positive childhood experiences is a protective factor in and of itself and facilitates safe, stable, nurturing relationships. So, I mean, it just, without it, you kind of just make those things impossible to reach. Um, so I think giving families that tiny, it's almost like it's this little magical ingredient that we just have to help people see. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. You could not use it, but at least, you know, it's there. I, I have, I have one other kind of pointed question like that before we do what I call our rapid fire questions at the end. Okay. Um, so a, a, I don't know, a year and a half ago now you came to um, a conference out here on the West Coast with me, and yeah. you used a phrase that still sticks with me. And you said, "We're having to unlearn what we learned in medical school." Can you just speak to your colleagues for a moment about what that means for you? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I it just breaks my heart. But the way we are trained when we become physicians is basically to set aside our feelings and to set aside our needs. Um, and to just kind of hunker down and learn how to um, to just work until we are um, so incredibly exhausted um, that we just collapse at the end of the day. So, I mean, over time and depending on where you were in your training, you know, you may or not may or may not have experienced 140 hour work weeks and some of these ridiculous things that some of us have done, but even 80 hour work weeks or even, you know, 70 hour work weeks or even some 40 hour work weeks when you're dealing with abused children and stuff. I mean, these can be just exhausting. So just like going back to thinking about what it was like when you still knew how to, knew how to take care of yourself and mm -hmm. just remembering that it's really important to take care of yourself. And I remember the dean of my medical school actually saying, you can't take care of anybody else until you take care of yourself. And I got it sort of intellectually, but I really didn't get it um, like physically or emotionally until I started doing this resilience university work. And then I was like, oh, right. <laughs> like I have to actually do this first and do this with my family and do this with myself, because if I'm not doing this, like really doing this for me, then I'm just like, not going to be able to really do this for my families. Like I have to be able to a hundred percent show up in that room for families. And then if I'm so tired and I actually have to pee and I haven't eaten anything and I, I feel horrible and I'm trying to not cry and I walk into the room, I don't have enough to do any of this. So we really do have to take care of ourselves and we have to stop thinking that somehow we're invincible and we can live off of um, fumes and get by on no um, self-care <laughs> and self-care doesn't mean like going, um, to get a facial or a massage once every six weeks or something. This means like, you know, really taking care of yourself and making sure that you don't overdo it and you don't overwork yourself and you ask for what you need at work and you advocate for yourself and for patients and take time to eat and rest and sleep and pee and all those things that we tell patients they need to do. So I just feel like we could literally make a list. Of right. All the things you just, right. Are you doing um, these things? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like Resilience University has given back to you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, I, it's one of the most joyous things that I've, I've done in my, in my career. So yeah, it's been very fun. Okay. So a um, couple of fun rapid fire questions to wrap up. Um, <laughs> what's one thing people get wrong about physicians? Hmm. Well, now that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't think I was planning for that one. Um, well, I think that they think we will always have the right answer to everything. And I think we often um, 
probably if it was up to us, would like to be able to say, we don't know, and we'll figure it out for you. I love that. I love that. I, I was going to offer you, Gretchen, if you still, if you were stumped, that, that one thing people get wrong about physicians is that they know how to make glitter jars. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which everybody should learn how to make. Everybody but. should know how to make. Well, it's funny because, yeah, I was kind of stumped by having the answer to the question. So but <laughs> doctors don't always have the answer to the question. <laughs> um, if you could go back um, and talk to young Dr. Pianca, what would you tell her? <laughs> well, um, maybe that it's going to get easier over time when you finally figure out what the most important medicine is. <laughs> mm, <aw. laughs> yeah. It took me a little time to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love yeah. that. Um, so often in healthcare, I think people get intimidated by professionals and on the patient side of things, you know, to talk about their own trauma or, or worries can feel really intimidating. And so I feel like one of the most important things physicians can do is to also just be humans. Mm -hmm. um, and can you share one thing that just makes you a messy, perfectly imperfect human? <laughs> Sure. Oh gosh. I almost feel like I have a, so many things to choose from. I don't know where to start. <laughs> um, well, um, let's see. Um, um, hmm. I suppose, um, It seems know. like you're sorting through a long list. I am. I'm sorting through all sorts of things. Sometimes I feel like it's absolutely amazing that I ever got in to medical school. Um, so I actually got waitlisted and almost didn't get into medical school. Mm -hmm. um, I um, um, I don't know. Um, I I got in off the wait list to get into med school and I almost went to medical school in Australia because I wasn't getting into medical school in the United States. Um, so I don't know. I, um, yeah, I, I feel like I had a hard time with my, um, with learning. I had to write everything out with outlines to get information into my brain. Um, I think that probably if somebody had done an educational analysis on me when I was little, I probably have some sort of processing thing because it's very hard for me sometimes to get information in and out of my brain, but I never had anybody help me with that. So I figured out how mm -hmm. to do it. And now I have a good way of doing it and I know how to do it, but I learned it on my own. And um, I have a lot of compassion for kids who need extra assistance in school, because I think it can be really hard to get information in and out of your brain and everybody learns differently. So there's one. Thank you How's for that? sharing that. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know that I have residents who listen to this podcast um, and medical students who might be like questioning their abilities. And so thank you for sharing that. Um, sure. <laughs> okay. Last question, the most difficult, I'm sure it's 11 o'clock at night and you have a food craving. What do oh. you look for? Hmm. Well, that has changed over time. Let's see, what would it be right now? Probably tacos. <laughs> <laughs> And Probably tracos. trailer trailer park tacos are my current favorite. Um, nice, nice. So I those are it. like fried chicken with queso. That's a fried. That's a trailer park taco. Fried chicken with queso. Fried fried chicken with queso. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love this. Um, thank you so much, Gretchen. Sure. Um, I, I really want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'm so glad to have met you in my life and you are a change maker in pediatrics and trauma-informed care and resilience. And I'm just grateful to know you. Thank you. So nice to meet you. And I'm glad you're in my life too, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. <laughs>